Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. I worship your holy name. We had Lindsay on organ and Michelle on piano. Thank you, ladies, so much. And uh, I want to thank our audio team. The organ is not uh, powered through our audio system. So for the folks watching at home or for the recording, they needed to get some uh, sound to be able to pick it up and run it through the system. So uh, thank you for taking that extra step to make sure that's possible as well. Hope hope that those of you at home were able to pick up the organ. Did you hear the organ in here? <laughs> that was wonderful. I love how it fills uh, the whole sanctuary. Oh, Let's pray together. God in heaven, we love you again. We just express our love and appreciation to you right now. We want to hear from your word. So God, just be in our hearts and be in this place. Attend to us and be our guest. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, um, last week I said, you know, I'm going to start a, a series, kind of a building on a, a singular idea of faith matters and matters of faith. And so um, that's where we're going today. And when you think about all of the things, Scott, is that you? How did you get in here? Wow. I don't treat everyone this way, by the way, but he's one of my putties from Spokane. So good to have you here. Sometimes people surprise me like that. Anyways, where was I? <laughs> When you think about all of the breadth and width of matters of faith that we can talk about, there's so many areas we could look at. There's our 28 fundamental beliefs, right? Um, and we could go through those and, and there, there'd be a lot of benefit from that. But then there's our 13 baptismal vows. You know, we could look at each of those. Those are obviously matters of faith. We could go through the Ten Commandments. Obviously, we value those and we could look at that. There's the nine fruits of the Spirit or the eight Beatitudes, the seven deadly sins. I mean, where do we begin? Or we could look at the five essential doctrines, as George Knight calls them. Or maybe just the three angels' message. Well, I decided to use my own list. I'm not using any of those. <laughs> and I decided that uh, when we're talking about faith matters, I wanted to begin at creation. You know, the Bible begins at creation. That seems like a, a good place to begin the discussion, doesn't it? And so uh, we're going to use our time uh, this morning and uh, as, at this junction of our worship to look at the doctrine, the biblical teaching of creation and why it matters. Why it matters. What's at stake about whether we believe this, how we believe it, how the Bible presents it. What's at stake and why it matters. Again, it's not enough, friends, and this is kind of what I, I did in my introduction last week. It's not enough to simply say, I believe it. I believe it. That is not enough. And again, just to dovetail a little bit into last week, as Dr. John McKay said, commitment without reflection is fanaticism. But reflection without commitment is paralysis, or I like to use the word hypocrisy. It's not enough just to say, I believe it. Why do you believe it? Why do you believe it? How do you, how does your belief in it impact your life and impact your faith and how that, uh, serves you in this Christian journey that you're on? All right? We have to use this tool that God has given us. We are not simply robots that God has sent the programming code into our head and say, Hey, when I say it, you just believe it, but don't think about it. Just believe it. That's not how God created us. That's not how it works. He wants us to use this powerful engine and tool, this blessed gift of intellect and thinking and reflection and contemplation so that we can apply our faith to our lives. So I want you to believe it, but I also want you to have the tools and ability to reflect on that and to understand why the belief is so important. So that's where we're going to go. Now, as Gina mentioned earlier, without the kids, I normally, for, for our guests here, I normally uh, have a little moment with the kids in the sanctuary called the Kids Quiz. Um, but for today's purposes, uh, I do I switch to a teen trivia. And um, you guys are, oh, there it went. Maybe I'm just not hitting the right spot. We're going to figure this out. So for our young people here, our teens, I would love to have you just raise your hand and help me out uh, to begin the discussion on the doctrine of creation. What did God use to create the world? What tools or what assets did he use? Emma, thank you. Yes. Okay, his speech. His Can, we, can I say his word? Yeah, all right. That's very good. Let there be light. Let there be, you know, all the things that he says. But there is more to it. 
We want to let the team, Danica, you're very youthful at heart. I realize that. We will come back to you, though, if any other young people want to help out. So, yes, can you think of other things, though, that God used? It's not meant to be a trick question. I wanted to, to see if you had a, an ability to think creatively about this, though. Any of our young people? Oh, Amelia, I'm so sorry. Here, I'm looking beyond and I need to look right in front of me. Yes. His hands, doesn't he? Well, yeah, he did. The Bible says he formed man. And, and uh, yeah, so we'll talk about that. So yes, absolutely. Anything else? Oh, my, oh, my. Uh, Miss O. Oh, okay, Anthony, yeah. Okay, his creativity, his mind. Absolutely, I like that. Miss O, I, I don't want to take away this wonderful opportunity. You got it? All right. Well, again, I didn't mean to be tricky. These are all good things. We could say a lot of things. His power and his, his, you know, things like that. Here are the things that, that, um, I put it. Obviously, his word, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were cre uh, created and they stood. His breath. All right, his breath was used, and that goes along with word, of course. His hands, as Amelia said, um, the Bible talks about us being as clay in the potter's hands in Jeremiah. And then, of course, God formed man, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. His heart, all right? What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world. And I know that he, that is intended to be, you know, the people that he created. But God, God loves the world. All right, creation is an act of love. Even today, when we have the act of procreation, we call it making love. Right? It is an act of love. So we cannot eliminate the element that this was not just a God in some arbitrary way just saying, okay, let's just make something because I make it. And now there it is. It was an act of love. And then his will. Revelation says that by his will, the heavens were established. By his will. And the word there really means his pleasure, his joy, his excitement. Uh, John Hammond said that creation is a sheer act of will. If you recognize that quote, tell me later. <laughs> Creation is a sheer act of will. He did it because he loved it and he enjoyed the ability to bring life and creativity. So these are some of the tools, you know, his power, creativity, his mind, all those things going there. All right, how long, according to the Bible, how long did it take God to create the world? I didn't even raise your hands. Jonathan. Oh, a little tricky, a little tricky. Not seven days. And an argument can be made that the seventh day was an act of creation. But Anthony, it is six days. Six days. Six days. He, he rested. I know, not six days. Six days, according to the Bible. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and why that is sometimes misunderstood or controversial. Number three, on what day of creation did God create plants? How, how well do you remember your creation sequence on which day did he create plants i know some of you are over here i'm not going to ignore you i'm trying to keep an eye out for young people so if you have anything you want to raise your hand to do you remember you remember your genesis and the sequence of how things work on what day did he create plants we're not going to spend all morning on this guys david it is day three very good I think it's day three. Yes, the third day. The third day. Now, this is important in, in the dialogue of, of the analysis and the controversy a little bit about uh, creation and evolution. Um, and for those that uh, uh, want to try to uh, in, interpret this a different way, but I'll, I'll mention that one in a second. So on the third day, he creates plants. All right, and so on which day did he create the sun and the moon, or as Genesis says, the greater and the lesser lights? What day did he create those yeah not so he creates light that's that's true he does the first day let there be light but actually it's not the first day that he creates the sun and the moon so it is a little bit interesting how that dynamic works so that's good thinking but it wasn't on that day all right Amy. It's not on the second day either. Sometimes you can't listen to mom. Mom will lead you astray. 
<laughs> she had <laughs> Heather, was that a yawn or did you? Do you want to make a guess? You're going to have to say it or do. I heard it. She said fourth. Did you hear her? Yeah, it was actually the fourth day. And why this is interesting from those who come from a creationist perspective, a biblical creation, is that those who want to argue for long eons of time for each day, you have a problem if you're going to say the Bible story supports that because if plants are created on the third day, but that day is actually eons of time, plants cannot survive without abundant energy from the sun. So you have a problem simply from a sequence if, you, if you're if you trying to meld the two ideas together that if plants are made on the third day, but that's millions of years, and it's millions of years before a robust sun is producing energy, how are those plants living during that time? We, we, we would have an issue with that. So that's an interesting element to the creation. All right, one more uh, slide here, and I don't know why this is uh, always a problem. What did God call the world? when he was done creating it. And I give you some multiple choice here. What did he call the world? There's something very specific that he called the world. Did he call it chaotic and violent? Did he say it's very good? Did he say it's formless and void? Or did he say it was practically perfect in every way? I want to see some... Okay, I saw Anthony put his hand right up. What do you say, Anthony? B, it is very good. And if you recall during the Genesis account of creation, every day that he created, it says, and the Lord saw that it was good. And there was evening and morning, the you know, first day. And the Lord saw that it was good. And there was evening and morning the second day. But by the time you get to Genesis 131, the Lord says, and when he had finished his creation, behold, it was very good. God looked down at what he had made and declared, I am happy with what we have. It is not a polluted, decaying, dying, chaotic, brutal environment. It is very good. And it was formless and void when he started, and um, he was not Mary Poppins saying practically perfect in every way. Now, um, so it was very good. Now, if God really knew that we would be struggling with this matter of faith in the last days, we would anticipate that he would say in Scripture that in the last days, this would become a question. And sure enough, throughout the Bible, in a lot of places, I'm just going to show a few here, God did know that this would be a specific question among believers and among the people of the earth before he comes back. And many of you know this passage from Second Peter. Uh, you know this, first of all, that in the what days? Last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust. And by the way, if you want to be mocked, try standing up for creationism in any scientific setting right now. And I don't mean that as a tongue-in-cheek or a joke. Um, try standing up. And by the way, thousands of scientists in America have anonymously declared that they reject neo-Darwinism, but they are afraid to go on record for that because they know that they will be excommunicated from the um, scientific community. The National Academy of Sciences would be the very first to, to, to come against them because there is so much vested interest in this. In the last days, mockers will come, mocking, uh, with their following over their own lust and saying, where is the promise? of his coming forever since the fathers fell asleep all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation they say nothing has changed everything is going from the just the way it started for when they maintain that it escapes their notice that by the word of the lord the heavens existed long ago the earth was formed out of water and by water and through which the world at that time was destroyed being flooded with water so here peter is telling the church in the last days people will reject the reality of creation by the word of god and the judgment of god through the waters of noah's flood and that's exactly what we see today and when you think about the first angel's message it's very interesting the first angel comes to the uh, to the world just before christ comes and his message is this fear god and give him glory because the hour of his what has come? Judgment. I should have highlighted that as well. Just as Noah's flood was a judgment, so also will there be a judgment at the end of time. And he, then he goes on to say, worship him who did what? Who made everything. Now, why would the first angel say that unless the, the Lord knew that in the last days people would not be worshiping the creator God? 
I mean, if everyone was worshiping the Creator God, there'd be no need to reiterate it. So by the very fact that the first angel's message says, return to the worship of the Creator God, is an acknowledgement that in the last days, people of earth will have forgotten that God is their Creator. Worship Him who made everything, the heaven, the sea, the earth, the sea, the springs of water. And then there's one more biblical analogy that I like to use in this. It goes all the way back to the book of Numbers. You remember when uh, the Exodus generation was going to go into the promised land and Moses sent spies in to look at the land to see how to, how to, how to do it and they come back. Ten of the spies are shaking, right? Their knees are knocking together. They don't like what they see. And so they, they, uh, uh, convinced the children of Israel not to, uh, take over the promised land. This is what they say in Numbers 13. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, all the people whom we saw there are men of great size. Okay? They, during their, their spying, they see these large, what in their eyes are, you know, giants and people that seem very strong, very powerful. But then they say this, there also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. And what's interesting about this, well, I'm not, we don't have time to go into all the theories and ideas of who the Nephilim were. The Nephilim existed before the flood. Before the flood. And yet, in their mind, somehow the Nephilim clinged to the side of the ark during the flood and did not perish. Somehow the Nephilim su survived, and now they're dwelling in Canaan, and they're unable to consider the fact that they now need to go in and conquer the land. The point is this. They forgot the creation story that Moses had given them. They were able to allow fear and doubt and disillusionment dominate their thinking so that they created a myth that was not true. The Nephilim were not in Canaan at that time. They were destroyed during the flood. Only Noah and his family survived. But their forgetting of that um, origin story and the forgetting of the first chapters of the uh, book of Genesis that was handed to them by Moses, they allowed their misunderstanding or their neglect of that reality to prevent them from accomplishing God's will. And because of that, they wandered in the wilderness and were unable to enter into the land. And so we need to remember what's at stake when we think about the doctrine of creation. What's at stake? And why does the doctrine of creation matter? Now, I love history. I think we learn so much from history. And I would share with you this morning that you can make a direct connection between some of the most dark chapters of the 20th century and the scientific theories of the 19th century. When Darwin and uh, materialistic evolution begins to build up speed in the latter part of the 1800s, by the time you get to the 1900s, you have Western, intelligent, educated societies beginning to apply Darwinistic thinking to how they do things. And as a result, we get eugenics. And so in the early part of the 1900s, you have the forced sterilization Social Darwinism, the forced sterilization of people who had traits that society said, we don't want you to be able to pass on those traits. You had the best baby contests all over the United States. Contests about who has the best babies. And you want to know who wasn't allowed to be decided if they had a best baby? Black and ethnic people. Which they were systematically told, you can't have a good baby. Your traits, your color disallows you from even being allowed to be considered of having children that are worthy of this analysis. You have the forced experimentation of drugs and vaccines and, and surgical experiments on less than desirable people. It's one of the darkest chapters of American history, eugenics. All can be traced back to Darwinism and the theory that we come from a naturalistic source, thereby uh, we can decide who has value and who doesn't have value. In the 1930s, when Hitler comes to power in Germany, it was not a secret what Hitler believed. He publishes Mein Kampf, uh, Mein Kampf in 1925, where he specifically says and blames the Jewish people for the woes of the Aryan society. And in 1936, he stands up before the Olympics and says, you will see the master race dominate these games. He was openly promoting for decades that he believed in open racist Darwinism. And no one was surprised by this, by the way, because this was a common thought among many people. We were still uh, dividing people by race and segregation in the United States and across the world as well. 
So when Hitler decides that he will now use Darwin, uh, 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 evolution and, and Darwinistic thinking to try to manipulate society, he was simply making a logical connection to what materialistic evolution pointed to. And by the way, it wasn't just in Germany. Do you know there were two holocausts in World War II? There were two holocausts. And by the way, it is a symptom of racism that we only mention one. There were as many Chinese, as many Chinese systematically executed by the Japanese Imperial Army as there were Jews in concentration camp, Jews in concentration camps. Excuse me, a little dry in the mouth. There were two Holocausts, six million Chinese, six million Jews killed. And I'm not trying to lessen one or build up the other, but it's again, how come there are no museums to the Chinese? How come there's no uh, mass awareness of what happened to the Chinese? Isn't that also a symptom of historical racism that we don't include the, uh, uh, the, the Holocaust of the Chinese? So again, this was common uh, among so much thinking uh, during the 19th century. And then right as you go into communism and Marxism and between 60 and 100 million in China and in, uh, uh, in Russia through political and social Darwinism, are executed by those movements. Wow, she brings books and she brings water. She's awesome. So some of the darkest chapters of human history can be directly traced to the humanistic, materialistic theories of evolution. Now, I will tell you, today, uh, scientists and evolutionists will scream that what I've just told you is inaccurate and inappropriate. They will, they will absolutely reject and deny that, that these connections, uh, were ever intended or are appropriate. Well, let's just look at, uh, again, a little history for a second. This is an actual copy of Origin of the Species. You can, um, uh, buy this on, uh, Walmart right now. Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection. Charles Darwin's, uh, book that he publishes. Can you see the title, the subtitle that's just under that? Let me, let me uh, zoom in a little bit for you. Origin of the species by means of natural selection. Can you read it? Or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Now that's not, that is in a, that's, that's how the book was published. That's what it says. Or the preservation of the favored races in the struggle for life. Now again, Darwinists and evolutionists will say today, oh, but Darwin didn't mean people. He meant species of animals and varieties of cabbage and pigeons. He doesn't mean people. Now, um, you have the right to your own opinion. You do not have the right to your own facts. Now, it is absolutely the case that Darwin was making the case that humans are animals. He was specifically saying, so to, to try to say that he was not including humans, it, it goes against what his entire theory was, that we are just simply the next stage of animalistic adaptation and evolution. And we can go to Darwin's words himself. Now, this is in his book, The Descent of Men, published in 1871. Now, listen to this language. And this is Darwin, 1871. No one was shocked really by this because this was pretty much common thinking. This is Darwin's words. At some future period, the civilized races of men will almost certainly exterminate and replace. You see those words? Will certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. He says this is a natural, this is, this is clearly what would be natural part of survival of the fittest. The break between man and his nearest allies will be wider for intervene between man and a more civilized state, as we may hope, even than the Caucasian and some ape as low as the baboon, instead as of now, between the Negro and Australian, which he means the black aborigines of Australia, and the gorilla. In other words, there are, there are these lesser than human creatures between the Caucasian and the baboon. And he includes the Negro and the Australian and the gorilla. Okay? It was an absolute part of the theory that one form of humanity was superior to the other and it would be necessary and even to the benefit of the species if one race was to exterminate another. 
So I just simply reject based on the facts that Dar- Darwinistic thinking and methodology did not impact the dark chapters of the 20th century. So what's at stake? I would say a lot's at stake if we get this wrong. All of life, okay, all of life is different. If you accept biblical creation, all of your worldview and thinking and morality and ethics is this way. If you accept materialistic uh, causes and natural selection, all of life and thinking will be another way. And you may be at a different place in your journey in reaching its logical conclusion. However, the two will draw you in radically different directions. Alexander Solzhenitsyn um, is a Russian writer, Nobel Prize winner, and I wanted to share one thing that he said before he died in 1989. If I were asked today to formulate as concisely as possible the main cause of the ruinous revolution that swallowed up some 60 million of our Russian people, could I, uh, I could not put it more accurately than to repeat, men have forgotten God. That's why this has happened. That's why this has happened. And he would blame Marxism and uh, Darwinist, Darwinistic thinking for how the tragedy of the gulags and the Russian people uh, were able to happen. So we only have so much time in one message to really delve into so many areas. I'm going to try to make this as concise and applicable as possible. You have the two sides of the debate when it comes to the uh, origins and stories of creation. You have biblical creation, which includes a recent, not millions of years ago, literal, okay, not symbolic or anything like that, and special, not natural, not accidental, but from the mind of God. That's biblical creation. And then you have neo-Darwin materialism. And by the way, why we call it neo-Darwinian evolution is largely because of the discovery of DNA. There's no official definition of neo-Darwinism, Darwinism, uh, um, but largely it is the uh, the discovery of DNA. When DNA and DNA theory uh, developed in the 1950s and then skyrocketed, skyrocketed in the 1980s, it threw <laughs> under the bus virtually everything that Darwin wrote about evolution. And so they had to come up with new layers of explanation, and that's where neo-Darwinian um, evolution comes from. But you have these two opposing sides. Now, there is an attempt to sometimes marry these together. When creationists take a step towards evolution, it's called progressive creationism. Okay? Progressive. It means they still believe that God, you know, uh, was in control, uh, but the, the, the days of creation were probably great eons of time and there was all kinds of uh, evolution and uh, mechanisms causing the adaptation, but they still accept that God and that the, the, the basic biblical structure uh, is, is instructional. That's called progressive creationism. When evolutionists take a step towards creationism, it's often called theistic evolution. And that's where most of intelligent design is. Intel- most people that uh, uh, um, embrace intelligent design would probably call themselves, Mike, Mike Behe, um, Dean Kenyon, they would call themselves theistic evolutionists. They still believe, and the two are basically the same, it's just the beginning point is a little bit different. They do believe that there had to be a, a deistic entity that designed life, uh, but they still see a validity in many of the uh, mechanisms of evolution. Now here's here, here's the point. Here's the point of reflection. I just simply ask, can these two blend? Is there any way of harmonizing these two? I'm going to be arguing from the Scriptures to you today that the answer to that is no. There is no... Medium. It's kind of like when C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity says, you cannot say that Jesus was a good man, but he was not God. You, you cannot do that. And you hear people, oh yeah, he's a good prophet, good rabbi, good teacher, a lot of moral things, but no, he wasn't God. C.S. Lewis says you're not allowed to do that. If anyone walking around claiming to say what, what Jesus said was actually a liar, he'd be considered either a lunatic, and I love how Lewis says it, or the same as someone who calls himself a poached egg, or he'd be the devil from hell. But let us dispense from this idea that he can be both a good man but not God. And the same is true in this argument. You cannot merge the major principles or really much of the principles at all without doing devastating uh, 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 
uh, harm, excuse me, devastating harm to the original proposition. And, and I want to share with you some, some ways in which that happens. So when it comes to our faith, the doctrine of creation, and we could apply many applications here, but it would challenge the integrity of the scriptures, the integrity of the Sabbath, the very integrity of human value and the soul, and the integrity of the plan of salvation. If we were to allow any forms of evolution, evolutionary theory into our contemplation of origins. So I'm just going to go through these fairly quickly, one by one, and show you what I mean by this. If we try to twist Genesis 1 to become eons of time with living and dying and slow changes over time so that eventually we get to human beings it would destroy all of these principles. And let me share with you why. Let's first look at the integrity of the Scriptures. All of Scripture, not just Genesis 1 and 2 and the first chapters there, is predicated on the accuracy and authenticity of the creation account. In other words, every Bible writer who comes after Moses believes that what Moses said was literal and real. So we can't just say we're going to slice off Genesis and say that's symbolic, that is great eons of time. We're going to twist the interpretation of that and it won't affect everything down the line. Okay? It doesn't work that way. Moses, Job, David, Isaiah, the Bible writers all write as though when God said it, it was done. The Lord spoke and creation happened. By the word of the Lord, by the breath of the Lord, by the spirit of the Lord, creation was established. There is no indication through any of the additional Bible writers that this was a slow, systematic process. They all believe that Genesis is accurate according to the plain reading of six days of creative power of God. And even if you want to argue that the Old Testament writers may have gotten wrong in some of their context and they had cultural things that maybe we know better about, look at what Jesus himself says when he uh, shares that he accepted that the story was real and true. Now, I'm going to take you to Matthew's version of this. Mark is actually a little more specific in his language, but there's a part here in Matthew I want you to see. Jesus is speaking, and he said to them, Have you not read, and obviously he's talking about the book of Genesis, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning, from the beginning, Now, it'd be hard for Jesus to say that if humanity is actually at the very end of millions and billions of years of evolution, right? Now, we know that even in the creation week, man is the final thing, but it's still within the first week. Within the first six days, humanity is the pinnacle of God's creation. And Jesus himself says that God did it from the beginning, and God made them male and female. So from the lips of Jesus himself, he he validates the story of Genesis as authentic and real. And then you see I highlighted the word and said here. This is called the chi apon, which is simply the Greek for and said. And is chi and apon is said. And the reason why it is of great interest to Bible scholars is that if you read as Jesus said it, who's doing the same? Who did the said? Thank you, Amelia. He who created them, from the beginning of man, said. Now what's interesting about that is in the book of Genesis, it's not God who said it. It's Moses said that Adam said it. Now follow this for a second. In Genesis, Moses said that Adam said this. But Jesus said, What Adam said was the word of God. Do you follow? It's called the Chi Apon. Jesus said that what Moses said, that Adam said, is actually what God said. Is it too early? Is it too late? Watch the recording later. Think it through. Jesus is authenticating that the the first chapters of Genesis are the Word of God. That's the point. And that they are accurate, trusted, real, and that the plain reading of the language is the truth that can be trusted. So you have the entire integrity. And again, we can spend all day, all afternoon on this. The entire integrity of Scripture 
is in jeopardy if we reject that. As Seventh-day Adventists, we value greatly uh, the, the Ten Commandments. And not only the Sabbath commandment, the, well, I'll get into it here. Um, the integrity of the Sabbath. What is the whole basis of God writing the Sabbath command? He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, which is a, another thing that's interesting that God knows we're going to forget. Right? It's the only command that begins with the word remember. And so you know that God is saying, you're going to have problems remembering this, so I'm going to enshrine in the command, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And he says, um, you know, do not do any work, your son, your, da- your daughter, your maid, sir. But in verse 11, four, now, uh, who wrote this? Did Moses write the Ten Commandments? Think of your Bible history. God wrote these commands. Moses received the tablets from the finger of God, right? It was not Moses listening to the Holy Spirit, and and so you can say, well, maybe he got it wrong. This is from the finger of God. For in six eons of millions of years, is that what it says? In six days, I did everything. So here you have the integrity of God himself at stake. If you want to believe that those six days were eons of time, take it up with God. I'm not going to call him a liar to his face. Do you want to do that? God himself says, this is important, guys. I did it. Remember it. And the Sabbath itself becomes really a foundational element to the rest of the Ten Commandments and to the law itself which is why we believe it's so important to respect all ten commands, including the Sabbath command, because it's the Sabbath that gives God the authority to command us around the other nine. I created you. I made you. Therefore, I have the right to give you these instructions to follow. Remember the Sabbath day. I did it in six days. So if you if you want to throw... Uh, You know, doubt on that. Take it up with God. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth. On the seventh day he ceased from his labor. And even in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 4, for he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Which really is an interesting question. If the first six days are eons of time, does that mean the Sabbath is an eon of time? That God rested for eons and eons of time and then said, okay, it's time to get back to work? It casts... So many problems. Sometimes we don't realize the number of challenges. Oh, and here in Ezekiel, I gave them the Sabbath as a sign that they might know that I'm the Lord who sanctifies them. The Sabbath is built on, predicated on the fact of a recent, literal, special creation. Six days. So what's at stake? The Scriptures, the Sabbath. What about the very nature of the soul? What happens If man is simply a slow, progressive development of animals, and how does that play? Well, I mentioned how the logical extension of that led to such devastating things in our last century. By the way, do you know that eugenics is not over? They don't call it that anymore, but it's widely promoted in our universities and among scientists. And uh, It's not like we're still a broken people. We haven't figured it all out yet. When you see how God describes the creation of man, we talked about this during the kids' quiz, God does something dramatically different when it came to the creation of Adam and Eve. Okay, Before that, he's speaking everything into existence. Let there be light. Let there be an expanse. Okay, Let there be earth. And let there be birds and, and, uh, and fish. Okay, That's fine. Powerful. Wonderful. And there is still beauty and intimacy in that. But when it came time for God to create man, he doesn't do that. He distinguishes a difference between humanity and the rest of life. You see God getting down in the dirt, don't you? The Lord God formed man. Okay, He didn't just speak it. He got down. He touched the earth. He formed it. And then he leaned over and he gave the kiss of life. He breathes into his nostril. The intimacy, the, the, the very nature of what it means to be human is illustrated and powerfully uh, connected to how God distinguishes that humanity is not like other animals. It is divine and it is special and not to be considered less or transitional. For you form my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully 
and wonderfully made. Not evolved, not accidental, not chaotic, not even natural. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And my soul knows it very well. The very integrity of the soul is at stake in this issue. Now we come to the final one that I want to share with you. The integrity of salvation itself. Now, uh, again, we could take a lot of time on this. I'm going to try to make it pithy and simple for us this morning. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. In other words, where there's no sin, there's no death. You with me? Where there's no sin, there's no death, according to the Bible. Well, where did sin in the human experience begin? Did it begin with animals and then millions of years of sinful animals being all naughty animals and then it got to man and then man sinned? No, you guys know the answer to this. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. Notice, evolution teaches that for eons of time, before mankind stands erect and becomes self-aware, that the survival of the fittest and the naturalistic principles were at play. And so you have violence and suffering and death and the strong preying upon the weak and the weak dying and the strong surviving for thousands and millions of years before there's even sin. Do you get it? In other words, what did Jesus die for if long before there was sin, there was plenty of death and dying and destruction and disease and suffering. Salvation itself, the whole plan of Jesus coming and dying for our sins to eliminate death becomes meaningless. Are, are, are you with me on this? It's not as simple uh, or as complex. It's just when you really reflect on it, sin is what introduced death. And we did not have sin until Adam and Eve violated the plan of God. So before that act of sin, there was no death. There was no death. No tree fell in the forest. No animal sat, was sacrificed and died. No stronger animal preyed upon the weak. God looked down at His creation and said, It is very good. And he would not have said that if the earth was simply a random, evolving, filled with death and struggle and trial until millions of years later, a human being becomes self-aware and says, oh, somewhere back there a God made me and oh, I shouldn't eat this tree. Oh. You cannot marry the two together. You can accept materialistic, natural, Darwinian evolution or you can accept the biblical account you cannot have them both. Not in any way making it work with the revealed Word of God. So what's at stake? We could say a lot of things but for, for purposes of this morning. The Scriptures themselves, the Sabbath, the will and law of God that follows from it, the very dignity of the human soul, and the plan of salvation itself. But I'm going to share one more thing as I close. What about the integrity of freedom? It is Black History Month. And I've heard it said before, well, why don't we have you know, Irish History Month and Jewish History Month? And, and I mean, there's been a lot of struggles and plights and peoples that have suffered. You know, why, why does only one group get to have this honorary time of remembrance? And, and I'll tell you um, why I, I don't mind personally. I'm not African American, in case you didn't notice. I'm, so I don't have that uh, literal connection to it. But as uh, someone who appreciates history, why I don't mind having a Black History Month um, and why I value it is because the plight of the African American and the black uh, in, in the United States of America embraced that their struggle was everyone's struggle. When, the, uh, when we had the civil rights movement of the 1965, it was not the African-American rights. It was not the black rights. 
It was civil rights. That's what the issue was in the 1960s in America. And on August 28th of 1963, when one of the most famous speeches and sermons was ever delivered on American soil, when Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream, Dream speech in, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And by the way, any of you have Mr. Murata? Mr. Murata? Does he make you memorize that speech? No? What has happened to the educational system today? I just was just going all... I have a dream. And as he goes through his powerful message, I have a dream that uh, the black man in Mississippi will be able to vote. And I have a dream that the uh, black man in New York will have something to vote for. He concludes that speech by saying, and when all these things happen, and when we allow freedom ring, and it rings from every village, in every hamlet, in every state, in every, in every city, we'll be able to speed the day when all God's creatures. How many of God's creatures did Martin Luther King Jr. say? Just the black creatures? When all God's creatures, black men and white men, Jew and Gentile, Protestant and Catholic, will be able to join hands together and sing the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty. Thank who Almighty? Thank God Almighty. We are free at last, it is on the basis of a belief in the creative power of God that freedom itself exists. You take away that, you take away freedom itself. And the basis of us escaping Darwinian thinking are, are, are remembering our Creator and remembering that the doctrine of creation matters. It matters. We should not take it lightly. We should understand how it impacts the rest of our faith. You cannot have a, a polluting of the creation doctrine without devastatingly impact the core ideas of Scripture and of God Himself. We are created by a loving Father. I'll close with this. Clarence and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this from of old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord, and there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior? There is none except me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would remember how our Bibles begin. I pray that we would not be afraid of the mockers. I pray that we would stand firm in the thought that the first angel's message comes to all of us and reminds us that we worship the Creator, our Creator, my Creator, that we are not accidental or purposeless. We are an act of your will and your love, your word and your breath. You formed our inward parts. And we are all equal in your sight. And we are all loved by you. God, as we march forth in a very complex world, and as we try to interact with those who may feel very different about this, help us to remember what we believe how important it is, and be able to have the tools to be thoughtful, redemptive, and careful in sharing your love with our world as well. We love you, Jesus. Bless us this day. In your name we pray, amen. Well, God bless you folks. Hope that you have a wonderful afternoon, and uh, hope to see you again next week. God bless.